thank you for joining our online service in Living Word IT Park. You may join us every Sunday at 10 a.m. for our English service. You may also give your love offering through online bank transfer or over-the-counter direct deposit. Bank details are shown on the screen. Morning, church. I'm glad you could join us once again for our online service. I have entitled today's sermon, The Crown of Suffering. And we will be studying Mark chapter 15, verses 16 through 20. So let me read this to you. The word of God says, And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters. 
And they called together the whole battalion, and they clothed him in a purple cloak. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews! And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And they had mocked him. They stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. And they led him out to crucify him. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the sacrifice of your Son. We are also thankful for opening our eyes, the eyes of our hearts, to see the beauty of Jesus Christ and his extravagant display of love on the cross. And through the presence of the Holy Spirit, our hearts are continually being changed and transformed to become more like our Savior, Jesus Christ. And I pray, O Lord, that you would continually perform that work in our lives. May it be the desire of your people to grow in Christ-likeness. And as we consider the example of Jesus, I pray, Lord, that we would respond in love, especially to those who have hurt us deeply. Father God, I commit to you once again our time of study I pray that your Son alone would be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Charles Spurgeon wrote, I always feel as if my tongue were tied when I come to talk of the sufferings of my Master. And I suppose that should be the response and reaction of all of us as we consider just how far Jesus humbled himself. Here we see the eternal Son of God, the Lord of the universe, the creator and sustainer of all things, the sustainer even of Pilate and his soldiers, humbling himself to become the object of man's abuse. But in the midst of this terrible abuse and humiliation, we will also see the majestic character of our Lord, his meekness, and his work as our Redeemer. And it's important for us to understand that because the greatness of his sufferings can only be understood in light of the greatness of his person. That's what the author of the book of Hebrews says. Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds all things by the word of his power. Paul says the same thing in Colossians chapter 1, verse 17. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And so Jesus is supreme over all things. He is supreme over every king, over every ruler, over every empire or nation. But despite his supremacy over all things, he chose to humble himself and allowed his captors to lead him to a place of torture. We find that in the very first statement of verse 16. It says, And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion. So there's one more stage of humiliation that Jesus needs to endure before he bears his cross. This is at the hands of the Roman soldiers who mock him as a king. And the text tells us that Jesus was led into the palace, into the courtyard, and then called together the whole Roman cohort. By the way, a cohort consisted of 600 soldiers, And when they learned that Jesus was this simple carpenter from Galilee who claimed to be the king of the Jews, accused of being a rival of great Caesar, well, they thought it was so absurd. And when they saw his condition, all they could do was treat him with complete contempt. They treat him as a joke. 
David Garland gives us some insight as to why these soldiers treated Jesus this way. He said, and I quote, Jesus does not fit any royal category known to them. People frequently take refuge in mocking what they cannot comprehend rather than trying to take it seriously. To bow down before such a king must have seemed to them both amusing and absurd. Why? Because Jesus had no army. His frail followers deserted him. He was totally powerless to save himself. End quote. And so they began to entertain themselves by mocking Jesus. They give him a mock coronation. And by the way, this mockery mimics aspects of Roman triumph whereby Caesar is hailed as emperor and receives homage. And so in verse 17, they clothed him in a purple cloak and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And so the garment Jesus wore was removed and a purple robe was put on him. Now just a now the garment Jesus wore was removed and a purple robe was put on him. Now just the act of removing his garment would have been painful after the flesh had been ripped from his back. But these guys were determined, these soldiers were determined to ridicule Jesus. And so the purple robe was put upon him to add to his shame. Matthew describes it as a scarlet robe. It was probably an old military cloak that was so faded that it had just enough color in it to suggest purple. And the reason why they chose this color is because it has been associated with royalty, power, and wealth for centuries. You need to understand during the ancient times, purple fabric used to be so outrageously expensive that the only ones who could afford it were rulers. And Mark also tells us they gave him a crown. But then this is a crown that's made of thorns. There is a wide variety of prickly, thorny plants in Israel, and perhaps they had a pile of these thorns for fuel right there in the courtyard. And so some of the soldiers took some of those thorns out of the pile and wove them into a wreath, probably an imitation of Caesar's crown. And once they made it, they crushed it down on our Lord's head. John MacArthur gives us an idea on how Jesus Christ painfully endured this. He said, in crushing it on his head, it would have punctured his head where there is much blood and caused the blood to run down all over his head and neck and flow down and be mingled with the blood that was still oozing out of his back and running down the rest of his body. As they press it into his scalp, it would have caused a great deal of bleeding, a great deal of pain. Now, for us, it's even hard to imagine something like this being done to someone we love. Let's say a close friend or a family member or a relative. And to know that this actually happened to the one who created us, the one who saved us, is really humbling knowing that Jesus Christ had to endure all of this because of our sins. And I would admit that as I was studying this, I was really affected by it, knowing that I do not deserve this kind of sacrifice from our Lord. But then again, all of this is done out of His love for us. And Matthew adds that in setting Him up to look like a king, in their little comedy, they put a reed in his hand. They put some kind of a mock scepter in his hand. And Matthew says in chapter 27, verse 29, they knelt down before him and mocked him. And that's what Mark says. They put themselves in front of him. Verse 18, and they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. Now, there is a great deal of irony here because as they mock Jesus as the king of the Jews, they actually make a statement of truth. Because Jesus Christ really is a king. In fact, he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So Jesus is a king. 
But as we have also been seeing in Mark's gospel, Mark presents Jesus as a suffering servant. Both truths are painfully expressed in this episode. And so here we see how he painfully endured this mockery willingly and obediently. Verse 19 says, And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him. So they took a reed and began to beat him upon the head. No doubt this caused the thorns to drive deeper into his flesh, adding more physical pain. And by the way, the tense of the verb indicates that they kept on spitting. They kept on insulting Jesus and hitting him with this reed. And in John's gospel, he adds this detail in John 19, 3, and went up to him again and again saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and they slapped him in the face. So Jesus is being mocked. He is being slapped. A crown of thorns is being placed on his head. He is being insulted. J. Carson, his commentary on this, writes, Here we have humanity at its worst. And what makes that statement true is not the cruelty of the act. As brutal as this was, as insensitive as it was, men have acted with cruelty toward other men in ways that are far more barbarous than this. So what makes their act so cruel and so wrong is the one to whom they do it. If Jesus Christ was sinful, if he was a murderer and a thief like Barabbas, if he was a convicted criminal, then we can understand their anger. You could say, in a sense, he invited it on himself. We can understand the ridicule. We can understand the abuse. But Jesus wasn't. He wasn't sinful. He was not guilty of any crime. No crime had been proven against him. He was innocent. And he'd been proven innocent several times. You see that through the record of the gospel in in Matthew, in Mark, in Luke. You see that from the beginning. In Matthew, for example, It records, after Judas betrayed the Lord, he begins to sense the wrongness of his act. And so he goes to the priest, he returns the 30 pieces of silver and says this, I have sinned in that I have betrayed innocent blood. And that for me is a very significant testimony because that's coming from the lips of Jesus' enemy. You know, Judas was a fake follower. He did not really love the Lord, but he still recognized that Jesus Christ was innocent, that Jesus Christ lived a perfect life, that he was not guilty of any wrongdoing. Pilate's wife, you'll remember, gave the same testimony. She said to Pilate, have nothing to do with that righteous man. Pilate himself repeatedly said, I find in him no fault at all. Herod found him blameless when he was brought before him. And the same testimony will continue at the cross when one of the dying thieves declares, this man has done nothing wrong. And at the foot of the cross, the Roman centurion also declared, certainly this man was innocent. His innocence and his person, and in saying that I mean his deity because Jesus Christ is the God-man, he is God incarnate, it's because of that that this act, this whole series of acts are so sinful and uniquely painful for him. And yet it's because he was innocent, because he is the God-man, that these acts that they commit against him are significant. You need to understand they did this against the one who created them. They did this against the one who was giving them breath and strength as they were mocking him at this moment. They did this against the eternal, infinite Son of God, the omnipotent second person of the Godhead. Verse 20, 
And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. Now at any moment, Jesus Christ could have stopped all of this with one word, and with one look, he could have brought these soldiers to their knees in terror. He could have easily swept away his enemies. He could have easily swept away Pilate, the religious leaders, the Sanhedrin, all these Roman soldiers. We know Jesus Christ has the power to do that. We've seen it in Mark's gospel. Jesus Christ has the ability to control nature. He was able to calm the sea. He was able to raise people back to life. He was able to cast out demons with one word. Clearly, he has the authority and the power to do that. But he did not have the will. Why? Because Jesus Christ came not to fight. He came not to kill. He came to die for the sins of the world. He emptied himself in order to humble himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on the cross. That's what Paul says in Philippians. That's why Jesus Christ came. He endured all of this pain. He endured the humiliation in silent patience because he had willingly accepted the mission that the Father had given him. Here men are striking him, but the greatest blow was still about to come. Because it's at the cross where Jesus Christ will receive the greatest blow. That's when God the Father will strike him. He will strike down his son. He will strike down the shepherd. And that's where sin will be atoned for. Only on the cross could sin be removed. Because it was there and there alone that the Father struck him. Jesus Christ absorbed the full wrath of the Father in our place. That is why he did not resist arrest. That is why he allowed the soldiers to lead him to a place of torture. He allowed them to mock him, to ridicule him, to beat him, to spit on him because he was committed to go to the cross. He knows that those beatings that he received from the Roman soldiers could not atone for sin because the book of Hebrews tells us Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. But Jesus Christ also knew that that was part of God's plan. He had to suffer in that way and eventually be led to the cross where he would become the sacrificial lamb of God, paying for our sins. But nevertheless, his sufferings at the hands of these soldiers showed his willingness to go to the cross on behalf of his people. And he endured it not only with patience, but with dignity, with the dignity of a true king. He endured all of this abuse, all of this pain for the sake of the elect, for the sake of the people whom he has chosen to save. And out of love for them, whom those he came to save, Jesus Christ endured all of that out of his love for you, out of his desire to save you, out of his desire for you to be reconciled back to God, and out of his desire to glorify himself as the true king and savior of the world. So all of this is done out of love. And there are four themes that we can apply to our lives as we look at the sufferings of Christ. First, we will also have extremely trying experiences in our lives and ministries. When we study the Bible and when we study church history, you will discover that many of God's choice servants have had to live with or suddenly face situations of extreme crisis. We see that in the life of Moses in the life of Paul, in the life of David. I also remember William Carey's wife who went insane on the mission field sometime after her infant son died. I remember Helen Rosevere who was raped and held by rebels and during a wave of anti-Western sentiment, she had to leave Congo 
the country she had served faithfully and sacrificially. I remember George Mueller's orphanages that often ran out of money to carry on and to provide food for the children. But God always provided through some highly unexpected means. I also remember John Wesley, a great man of God who was mightily used by God in England. Well, some of you may not know that John Wesley had a wife who did not understand his ministry. She did not support him and even suspected him and even worked to discredit his ministry. But despite all the challenges that they were able to face in life and ministry, they never gave up. They continued to serve the Lord gladly, faithfully, radically, and passionately. And because they remained committed to Him despite the many challenges they faced, they were given the opportunity to witness the mighty hand of God at work in their lives. They were able to witness how God faithfully provides for His children and how He graciously sustains them and upholds them by His strong hand. So I hope that we would follow their example. I hope we would remain faithful and loyal to the Lord despite the many trials that we might be facing right now. And I believe when you ask these men and women who have served the Lord faithfully, if you ask them why they were able to persevere during those difficult times, I believe they would tell you it's because of the sacrifice of Christ. It's because they understood the extent of God's love for them displayed through the sufferings and sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. The message of the gospel truly impacted them in such a way that their lives were transformed and they were willing to give up everything for the Lord Jesus Christ because they understood Jesus Christ has given up everything, His very own life for them. And if you understand the sacrifice of Jesus Christ just like them, nothing is going to stop you from glorifying God in your life. You will serve Him passionately and you will tell a dark and lost world that there is hope in the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Second, we must remain steadfast in times of trial. And the reason why I say that is because this rejection and mockery continues today. Many people today openly ridicule and mock Jesus Christ. Let me give you some examples. Uh, if you know Kyle Kuzma, he plays for the Los Angeles Lakers, and a few weeks ago he made a winning shot against the Denver Nuggets. And during the post-game presser, he was asked about how confident he was about taking that shot. And this is what he said. Even if Jesus Christ was the one blocking my shot, I would still take it. And it was his way of saying that he was really that confident. Conor McGregor is a famous UFC fighter. And when he was asked about his confidence in the octagon, he said this, even if I have to fight Jesus Christ in the octagon, I am confident that I am going to knock him out. Obviously, these men don't know what they're talking about. Those are very blasphemous statements. And that's the spirit of the age. That's how most people in the world respond to the Lord Jesus Christ. They mock him and ridicule him openly. And because of this, I believe some Christians can be timid and hesitant about sharing their faith to those around them. And I understand that one of the reasons is that they do not want to experience the pain of rejection or ridicule. But then again, if we claim to be true followers of Jesus, we cannot be silent about our faith. If you truly love the Lord and those around you, you will be vocal about your faith, regardless of the response. Even though if people would persecute you or ridicule you because of what you said about Jesus, you will be determined to speak about the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So the question is, how can we be steadfast like Christ under those circumstances? And how do we conquer the fear of rejection? First, we must expect to be rejected by a hostile world. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 24, a disciple is not above his teacher nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? John 15, 20 says, if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. And when they reject the message, the gospel that you proclaim, remember this, it is not you that they reject. It is the Lord Jesus and His Word that they are rejecting. Therefore, you did not fail in your obedience. Remember, God simply calls us to be faithful. We don't do the saving. That is the work of God. He just wants us to be faithful in fulfilling the Great Commission. Let me ask you this. How many of your friends know you are a Christian? You don't have to raise your hand anyway. I won't be able to see you. Let me add to that. How many of your friends know you are a Christian but don't understand the gospel or have never heard the gospel? Well, chances are the reason why many of your friends have not heard about the gospel is because they are waiting for you to explain it to them. Christian lady was surprised to find this to be true. Her friend of 20 years knew she was a Christian, but she had never explained the gospel to him. And after hearing a presentation on how to share her faith, God convicted her heart and made her realize that the reason why she went through that training for evangelism is so that she would be able to share the gospel. That training would be in vain. It would be meaningless if she did not practice what she learned. And so, by the grace of God, she was now committed to share the gospel to her friend. Even though she knew it could end their friendship. And after she shared the gospel to him, after a few days, she received a phone call. And her friend told her that he submitted his life to the Lord. He got saved. Why? Because a dear sister in the Lord was faithful and was courageous enough to share the gospel to him. I mean, how many friends do we have would be given that opportunity and that privilege, and who knows, they too might respond to the gospel of grace. Who knows how many people, how many friends of yours would be saved only if you were faithful in this area. So if you wish to experience the level of joy so many others have found, I pray that you would decide and that you would remain faithful to the Lord in the area of evangelism, that you would seek to share the gospel to those around you. You must be like Paul who said, I'm eager to preach the gospel. He was not only willing but eager and determined to preach the gospel to those who were in Rome. With every fiber of his being, he desired to preach or bring the gospel to them. He was even ready to suffer persecution, be beaten, be killed for the privilege of preaching the gospel. And at the end of his life, the Apostle Paul was able to say this, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And that's because he never allowed himself to be deterred from his calling. He never gave in to the temptation to seek popularity. He never compromised with the enemies of the gospel. He never allowed his ministry to be conformed to the world. 
He never tickled the ears of the crowd. Now externally, it may have seemed to the world that Paul was a failure. He spent a lot of years in prison. He was arrested and finally killed by the Roman officials. Yet even in those dark hours, the Apostle Paul kept preaching. When he couldn't preach to the crowds, he preached the soldiers assigned to guard him. When he couldn't minister in the churches, he ministered in the prisons. He was ready to preach, but never to compromise. And so I pray wherever God places us, whatever our situation in life is, may we be like Paul. Let us share the gospel in season and out of season. And if we're just sensitive to this situation that we are in, this pandemic, you will realize that there are actually so many opportunities to minister to your unsaved loved ones and friends. And if we have a courageous heart, if we have a heart that wants to glorify God, you will be amazed at the many doors that God will open for you to be able to minister to them in the same way that that Christian friend or mentor of yours has ministered to you. So, why was Paul able to suffer for Christ? Third, God will make a way to strengthen us in times of trial. We see this, for example, in the life of Jesus during his temptation in the wilderness before Jesus Christ started his public ministry. He spent 40 days and 40 nights praying and fasting. And during that time, Mark tells us in chapter 1, verse 12, At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with wild animals, and angels attended him. And we know when Jesus Christ was in great anguish in the Garden of Gethsemane, in Mark 14, it says, verse 43, An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And we also see how God comforted the Apostle Paul during a time of great affliction. In 1 Corinthians 1, it says, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experience in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and He will deliver us. On Him we have set our hope that He will deliver us again. And it is interesting that when Paul introduces the section about the crisis in Asia, he does it with a surprising, spontaneous outburst of praise to God. The praise immediately follows rather abruptly customary greeting with which the letter starts in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. It's really amazing to see how Paul was still praising God even though many people in the church in Corinth doubted or questioned his apostolic authority. There were some people in this church who did not respect him, who slandered him, who questioned his integrity and credibility as a minister of the gospel. Now when you experience something like that in life, it's easy for you to be bitter towards those people. It's easy to respond in anger, in resentment. But because the Apostle Paul knew that his security and his identity was rooted in Christ, he was not bothered by that at all. In fact, we learn a very important lesson in life and ministry here. The comfort or ministry of the Lord to us takes away the bitterness over the way we have been treated by people and circumstances. And the Apostle Paul was able to respond this way because he knew he was called to be like Christ. 
That was his primary calling as an apostle. And that is our primary calling as Christians. God wants us to be like Christ. We know that Jesus had shown a great deal of kindness to the Roman centurions throughout the Gospels. And I'm sure the Apostle Paul knew that. We see our Lord extending mercy whenever a centurion comes into the scene. For example, in Luke chapter 7, a centurion approaches Jesus and he tells Jesus that his servant is sick. Jesus did not reject him even though he was a Roman centurion, someone who was considered to be an enemy of his nation. Jesus Christ still ministered to him. He listened to his request and healed his servant from a distance. And always stands out to me that here is one who's done nothing but kindness to all of those with whom he had contact. Whether the person was a Jew or a Roman or a Gentile, Jesus Christ ministered to them. Regardless of their age, young or old, regardless of their gender, male or female, Jesus Christ was always ready to serve. He was always ready to do a kind act for that person. He has shown mercy and blessing to all. And what is he given in return? Abuse. He was being mocked here. He was being ridiculed. We too can experience something similar in our lives. We show kindness to a person, even make sacrifices for him or for her. But you end up being betrayed in the end. You end up being slandered in the end. How many of you have experienced that in your life? And when you were mistreated that way, how did you respond? See, when the pain is great, we sometimes think that we can punish the people who hurt us by remaining hurt and angry. We don't want the victory over our pain, for that would seem to reduce the severity of the wrong done to us. Indeed, trying to help and forgive such people is one of the most challenging things a Christian could ever face. But this I know, God does comfort. And we must go to Him in our desperation and cling to Him. If we respond like Jesus, if we respond like Paul, we will soon realize that God's love is greater than the wickedness of the people who have hurt us we will also realize that He is sovereign and that He will turn this situation into something good. In fact, many times, God allows these things to happen to us so that we would be made more like Christ. I mean, if we want to be patient, then something needs to test our patience, right? If we want to be forgiving people, then something must provoke us to respond in a forgiving way. So every time someone does something that hurts us deeply, know that that is an opportunity for you to depend on the Lord for strength, to ask Him for grace, that you might be able to extend forgiveness to that person. After all, beloved, the Christian life is all about knowing Christ and imitating Him in our lives. Now the pain, of course, may remain, for the loving heart must hurt when others do evil. But when we understand the forgiveness of God towards us, that can cure our hearts from bitterness, and it can be removed from us by the grace of God. And if we truly understand the essence of this episode, the suffering of Jesus, we must believe that God's love is greater and He is turning this evil into good and we have no reason to remain bitter. If Jesus was able to forgive those who mocked Him and ridiculed Him, we have good reason to forgive that person who has hurt us. Colossians 3.13 Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. 
So, beloved, don't let a day pass without waging this war against bitterness by utilizing the sufficient grace and comfort of God. So, as we consider all that Christ has done and endured for us, we should ask ourselves, what should I do for him? What should I be willing to suffer in his place? What should I endure? What kind of shame should I be willing to accept for him? Well, before you answer those questions, the most important thing you must do in order for you to be able to remain steadfast in a time of trial is that you must devote your life to him. We must devote our lives to him Because we can't really talk about making sacrifices for Christ if we ourselves are not completely devoted to Christ. You see, in this day in which we live, Christians face the real danger of being caught up in the spirit of the age. We all feel the powerful influences of this age, I think, one way or another. It's all around us. In fact, one old pastor observed that in the course of his ministry, he noticed a number of young men who showed a great interest in the Lord. They were serving in the church. They were using their gifts to glorify God and edify His church. They were discipling. They were evangelizing. They were on fire for the Lord. But as they got older and began to make their way in the world, some of them experienced success in their careers, in their businesses. God began to prosper them. But unfortunately, They got caught up in the world's pursuits. Soon they had little time for God. They would still show up in church, but clearly their hearts, their minds were not centered on Christ anymore. And soon they separated themselves from the people of God and ended up ruining their lives you need to understand that we have a very brief time in this world. Life is very short, and I'm sure you know that a few days ago, the Black Panther, Chadwick Boseman, passed away at the age of 43. Uh, Kobe Bryant, called the Black Mamba, passed away last January, and these guys are very successful. Uh, They're still very young. They still wanted to accomplish so many things in life, but just like that, they're gone. And when we see these things happening in our world, I hope it's teaching you to number your days. Make each day count for the Lord Jesus Christ because you never know when your time is up. While He gives us breath and life, let us live for Him. Don't look to the things of the world. Look to Him. And we could add, fix your eyes on Christ. Consider his crown of thorns, which he bore on your behalf. Fixing our eyes on Christ, that is what we are called to do. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And as we seek to live for him, as we seek to serve him, as we do that, we will stand for Him. We will witness for Him. We will tell this world, this lost and dark world, that Jesus Christ is the true King and the Savior of their souls. And as I mentioned, when we do that, when we declare the gospel to the world, we can expect to be treated the same way that our Lord was. For righteousness' sake, we will suffer His sufferings, either hostility or indifference, Either we will be struck by the world or we will be mocked by the world. Whatever it may be. But we have our Lord's example before us on how we are to respond to that kind of treatment. Our task, beloved, is to be like Christ in the midst of this fallen world. We are called to be salt and light. And as we seek to live for the glory of God, let us remember what Paul said In Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me 
and gave Himself for me. And as we seek to obey the Lord, as we seek to glorify Him, remember that this task has great reward. And Jesus Christ is coming back. He is coming back with His reward. And He's coming back not as a suffering servant anymore, but as a conquering king. That's when the heavens will open up and He will appear seated on a white horse, not wearing a faded purple robe, but a robe, as John writes, that's dipped in blood. Not wearing a crown of thorns, but a crown with many diadems. Not holding a reed for a scepter, but an iron rod with which He will shepherd and rule the nations. And by the way, those soldiers who mocked Him as King will someday stand before Him as King. And they will bow before Him, not in mock adoration, but in fear and trembling. As what Paul says, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It will be a great day of salvation, especially for us, His people, as we will be delivered from this present evil age and gathered into His kingdom. A day of great reward for all those who have served Him faithfully down through the ages. And so, beloved, are you looking forward to that day? Are you ready for it? Are you ready to meet your King? Or do you find yourself being caught up in the world and led away by the spirit of this age, becoming more like the world than becoming more like Christ. Remember, those who have not believed in Him, those who have not trusted in Him, those who have not treasured Him and valued Him as Lord and Savior will be guilty of terrible sin. The sin of rejecting Him, of treating Him with contempt, and one day they will give an account of that. But those who have believed, everyone who have believed, regardless of their sin, regardless of who they are, all who have believed will receive forgiveness. They will be delivered from this present evil age and they will be with Christ, their King, forevermore in heaven one day. And remember this, as you have received forgiveness from God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, your sins will be removed from you, will be separated as far as the east is from the west, plunged into the depths of the sea, never to be remembered again. That's the promise of the gospel. That's the hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Forgiveness of sins, life everlasting. It's all for those who believe in Him. And so if you have not believed in Him, I pray today you will trust in Jesus. You will look to Him as Savior and Lord and receive Him as such. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we once again praise and thank You for the sacrifice of Your Son. We are humbled by it. We are grateful for it. And I pray that we would be motivated by it so that our lives would bring glory to your name, that we would live for our Savior, telling this world about what he has done to save them. Whatever has been achieved today, Lord, we want to give you back all glory and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper. It is an exclusive celebration for those who have believed in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. It is not a means to salvation, but it is a testament of a believer's faith in the atoning work of Christ on the cross. As we celebrate the Lord's Supper today, let us read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 28.
Let us take this time to confess our sins to the Lord. Let us now thank God for the salvation and forgiveness we have received from God through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You may now partake of the bread and the wine. 